Now we're going to look at an even more complicated Punnett square, the dihybrid cross, shown here. So we just looked at a monohybrid cross. Mono meaning we were looking at one gene, and hybrid that we were looking at heterozygotes. So by definition then, the dihybrid cross, we have a cross between two individuals that on two separate chromosomes, in this case, have a monohybrid genotype. So we have a heterozygote for gene A, alleles 1 and 2. That same individual at a different gene, gene B, is also heterozygous. And we're going to cross that individual in a dihybrid cross to another individual with the same genotype. One of the reasons to use this type of a cross is to combine, for example, different traits. So you might have a trait that's controlled by allele 1 of gene A and allele 2 of gene B. And the, you, the result you're trying to get might be to combine those alleles together into an organism that's homozygous. So it's pure breeding, produces individuals only that contain homozygosity for gene A, allele 1, and homozygosity for gene B, allele 2. And that's one of the main reasons to do Punnett squares at all, is to be able to predict the efficiency, or the best cross, the most efficient cross, to produce animals or plants of particular genotype combinations. So in this case, now we have a bit more work to do in terms of predicting what are the gamete haplotypes produced by dihybrid parents. So here's the P0 generation, and here's the dad and the mom. It doesn't really matter which is which since they both have the same genotype. So now we know that for a single locus, half of the gametes are going to contain allele 1 of gene A. This is like a monohybrid Punnett square. And the other half will have allele 2 of gene A. And the same will be true for the other parent because it has the same genotype. So we can divide that Punnett square in half. For that chromosome, half have allele 1, and half of the gametes will carry allele 2. So we could already fill out for the first locus by filling down and filling across. We could see what the genotypes are just at that gene, but we're now worried about two genes at the same time. So now we need to fill in. How does the haplotype at gene A interact with or relate to what's happening at gene B? Well, remember during meiosis, when we have meiosis with two chromosomes, the video you already watched, what happens when you have one version of chromosome, for example, that carries gene A? How does that interact with whether or not that myocyte, sperm or egg, will inherit allele B1 or allele B2. Exactly half of the gametes that carry allele A1 will have one of the alleles at the other locus. The other half of those will get the other allele, B2. So we have combinations of A1 with B1 in, in this case, from male sperm. 25%, a quarter of the width of the entire table, half of those gametes have allele A1. Half of that half, 25%, will have A1 with B1. And A1 with B2, and the same is true over here, B1, B2. So that just like we saw in meiosis, Half of the gametes at one locus, locus A, gene A, half have one allele from a diploid. The other half of gametes have the other. The same is true, you can see, graphically, at the second gene, gene B. 25% plus 25%, or 50% of the gametes have allele B1. The other 50% have allele B2. So we haven't broken any laws of inheritance. 
we're just graphically representing the different combinations of genes and alleles that come from different loci. So now we've had to divide our Punnett square up into four different columns because there are four different haplotypes produced from meiosis. You saw this during the meiosis video. So meiosis has entirely everything to do with how Punnett squares are set up. Exactly the same thing will happen over here. So half of mom's gametes that carry A1 will have B1, the other half will have B2, So now we have a 16 square Punnett square, and we can fill this in with all of the genotypes from all of these individuals, the haplotypes from dad fill down in each cell, and the haplotypes from mom fill across. So for example, this gamete was A1B1, and this gamete from dad was A1B1. So the genotype, it's really important to remember that the genotypes are always written by each locus separately. So we look at A first, A1 slash A1, and then this is also B1, B1, A1, B1, A1, B1. Right. Homozygous for at gene A for allele 1 and at gene B for allele 1. And you'll see when you fill this out, which I encourage you to do, this is a good practice, fill this out with each genotype of each of the F2 offspring well, in this case, these are F1 offspring because this is a P0 cross, so we'll call these F1. Fill out all the genotypes of the F1s and then create the ratio. Look at all of the different genotypes in these 16 squares and figure out what the ratio is between all of those different genotypes. Like we had one to two to one genotype ratios for a monohybrid cross. What are the genotype ratios for the dihybrid cross? Another type of Punnett square I'd like you to fill out is what does the Punnett square look like when you have the P0 cross between a dihybrid and a parent that's homozygous at both loci? So come up with what is the structure, how many cells, what shape, what structure will it take to predict the offspring genotypes from this cross of individuals. Finally, a couple other questions. If my genotype was C2 over C7, and D1 over D1. What are my parents' genotypes? So see if you can predict, if you know my genotype, what are my parents' genotypes? So this is good practice for reverse engineering from the outcome of a Punnett square. Can you predict gamete types and ultimately the genotypes of the parents that produced those gametes.